Praise God. Today we're going to talk about this word called tongues, which is the Greek word for languages, which is in the context of God, uh, something holy and spiritual that we need to understand very well. Uh, you know, the Bible is written in really three parts. I don't know if you realize that, but it's not just Old and New Testament. It's really the Old Testament. Then it's the ministry of Jesus, which is the bridge. Then it's the New Testament. So it's written in three parts. And uh, during Jesus' time, no one used the word tongues or no one actually spoke with tongues. Uh, <clears throat> but after Jesus, tongues began. And we're known right now in the dispensation of tongues. Uh, the church age is the age where people speaking with other languages, tongues, to God uh, is evidence that we're still in the church age. Some have said the church age ended. ended it hasn't ended. Some have said that uh, things have all changed, but it, it hasn't since the book of Acts. So from the book of Acts on, we're in this special age called the church age, and in that age there's some key elements we have to be familiar with if we're going to succeed. So today we're going to talk about praying in tongues, why pray in tongues, what is it, what does it do for us? Are you ready? Amen. You know, I've said for many years, if I could, get you, if I could, if I could uh, pay you to pray in tongues, I would. And since I decided I don't want to do that, I'm going to let, I'm going to let Russ pay you to pray in tongues. <laughs> because if you don't pray in tongues, you won't have as much success with God. You won't have as much success in the earth if you never implement praying in tongues into your life. Now, some people hear this right now, and it's going right over your head. Well, I'm going to try to halt you. The other ushers have already locked the doors. You cannot leave. You have to understand these things, okay? Don't be bullheaded against the Word of God. Don't put up resistance. Oh, no, there's, I don't need that. I don't, want, I don't want to hear about anything about that. Some people do that. You talk about money, and they're like, oh, nope, la, 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 la. As soon as you start talking about raising children God's way, Parents, la, 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 I know all there is to know about that. I don't, I don't even want to think about my kids. I'm finally in church, away from them. I don't want to think about them, la, 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 la. <clears throat> Some people, you talk about tongues, and it's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I want that. I don't think that's for me. That's not for me. I think I'll just think about something else. But we can't do that, can we? So let's talk about it. We're going to get somewhere. It's going to excite you and thrill you, because the Word of God always thrills you. Yeah. If you'll, if, you'll, if you'll let your heart open up to the Word of God, man, something in there will start leaping on the inside of you. Amen. And so let's leap. Are you ready? Yes. Mark chapter 16. Let's get some scripture. Without the Word of God, without scripture, you can't have any faith. You can't believe anything right. You might as well, you're stuck in your own opinion for the rest of your life if you don't open up to the Bible. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus, right before he left, he said to them, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. What? Did you know the first thing he said that believers are supposed to do is cast out demons? Americans didn't even know there were demons. If you're a Christian, you ought, to be, you ought to have casted out a demon by now. Like I said, you can't leave, so just hang in there. But I... I don't know about you, but when I read this the first time, as, as a hungry Christian, I thought, ooh, okay, I got to cast out demons. Where are they? That was my take. And that's how, that's how honest Christians, pure Christians, are supposed to receive the Word of God. Oh, okay. I don't know what that is, but I'll do it. Amen. Yep. They will speak with new tongues. Hmm. Don't know what that is either, but I guess I'll do it. And then you go on and it says, take up serpents. To better find out what that means, don't you? If they drink anything deadly, it won't, won't hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. When I read the commission of the Lord Jesus Christ, my brain says, oh, I better find out what these are so that I can do them and please him. He said, I'm supposed to, I better. 
And so there's many things like that in the Bible that if you'll read it that way and think of it that way and apply yourself towards it, get the right information you need, study the scripture, put it into your life, you'll succeed. And you might find a demon lurking around one of your friends, hiding in one of your relatives. <laughs> And, and demons aren't going to show up and twist the neck all the way around every time so that you can recognize it. <laughs> Spit stuff on you. It it's not, doesn't always look like that. Those folks are in the insane asylum. <laughs> and they're tagged with a mental thing, and they don't even realize it's demonic. 99% of the cases in the mental hospital are demonic. But we, all we do is, all the medical profession can do is say, it's mental, it's genetic, here's medication, that's all we can do is subdue you. They used to zap them with electricity. Now they just medicate them to death, basically. So anyway, that's another story. Tonight we're talking about they will speak with new tongues. Jesus said if you believe, you'll speak with new tongues. If you're a believer, you'll speak with new tongues. If you're a believer, you'll speak with new tongues. Amen. I had one lady tell me, you know, she's fighting against tongues. People have done that for years just because it's supernatural. That's the only hesitation with tongues. It's because you have to kind of get out of your skin to do something supernatural. And the flesh says, I don't know about that. Well, the miracles of God and the supernatural things of God require us to go through the door of the supernatural. And tongues is the first step. And that's why getting filled with the Spirit is your entrance into the supernatural things of God where where you see God better, where you connect with Him better, where it just makes more sense. Even the Bible makes more sense. Did you realize that the, the New Testament from the book of Acts on, including the letters, the epistles of Paul and the other apostles, those epistles were written to a Spirit-filled church. They were written to people who had received the Holy Spirit, spoke with tongues, uh, experienced God, miracles, manifestations. And so if you, if you take a, a non-spirit-filled Christian and tell them to read the New Testament, they'll get confused. They won't be able to explain miracles. To the unsaved people or to the, uh, to the unlearned people, the non-spirit-filled people, you start talking about miracles and all they see is, uh, yep, God does miracles, don't know how, don't know when, don't really care. Uh, it's all up to Him. But the Spirit-filled folks understand that it's a working of God with man to get miracles to happen. That's just a for instance. Then you read the other instructions in the New Testament, and if you're not filled with the Spirit, all they become are just another set of rules. We're going to talk about that tonight so that you understand why it's important that we pray in tongues uh, and speak with tongues. Turn to Acts chapter 2. So Jesus told the early church, that they were going to speak with tongues. Then he told them to wait in the temple until they got it. Wait in the temple until they were filled with the Spirit. He said, wait in the temple until you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is Acts 1 verse 5. You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Know the terminology that in the New Testament, uh, there's synonymous terms that are used. Baptized in the Holy Spirit is the same as being filled with the Holy Spirit, is the same as having received the Holy Spirit. They're all synonymous, used in different ways by the different authors. But notice, <clears throat> he said they were going to get it, and then Acts chapter 2 is where they got it. They, went, they, they obeyed Jesus, went and waited for the Holy Ghost to come, now, you don't have to wait. That was Nobody since then has had to wait to receive the Holy Spirit. In the old days, the old church days, they used to have tarrying meetings where they had all the Christians hang out. You have to tarry for days, weeks, hours, months, years, tarry to get the Holy Spirit because that's what they did. They tarried in the temple. But that was just the first entrance of the Holy Spirit to this earth. Now we don't have to tarry. Now you receive Him by faith. And this is what happened here. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Just notice what happened when the Holy Ghost came. They were filled and they spoke with tongues. Anyone who's filled with the Holy Spirit will have the same experience. Turn to Acts chapter 19. <clears throat> Acts 
Acts chapter 19, verse 1, it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said to, him, said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, To what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. And then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So here you had some people that believed in God, believed in the prophets, believed in John the Baptist's message, and they had been baptized unto repentance with John the Baptist. But they had not been baptized in the name of Jesus, and they had not received the Holy Spirit yet. So then... They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When they found out Jesus had been resurrected, oh, he's come and he's, he's been killed and resurrected. Okay, they received him, baptized into water in his name. But then, verse 6, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Spoke with tongues and prophesied. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, people speak with tongues and prophesy. It's a magnifying God. It's an element of praise and worship that happens instantly where you're filled with God's Spirit and His worship toward God comes out of your mouth. That's basically what happens initially. So recognize that when a person is filled, baptized, or receives the Holy Spirit, that happens. I just wanted you to see that so that you, so that you know the basis and the first experience of tongues for a believer. Amen? Now, Howard Carter said this about tongues. He said, uh, speaking with tongues should not be an experience that someone has once in their lifetime. It's to be a continual experience that assists us in the worship of God. Amen. Yep. Tongues has a purpose. Tongues has a purpose. Now, <clears throat> in the scripture, there are three uses for tongues. And this is what has confused many. We didn't read the rest of Acts chapter 2, but it says... Uh, they heard, all the people came, and they heard those believers speaking in languages that they knew. And the Medes and the Persians and all these different people heard them speak with tongues and magnify God in their own language. That's the first use of tongues in a public setting. Someone has a tongue that goes out, and it turns out to be a language someone understands that's there. And, it, and it'll be a message from heaven. It'll be worship words or, or uh, gospel words, sometimes a full preaching message to a person who needs to hear it. Does that make sense? Just proclaiming the wonderful works of God. That's the first use of tongues, and it's a public setting. Then the second use of tongues is also a public setting. It's where someone in the congregation, maybe the pastor, maybe the preacher, maybe someone else, speaks in a tongue where no one else is speaking, speaks in a tongue, uh, that no one understands, and then someone in the congregation interprets that tongue by the Spirit. Both of those uh, applications are by the Spirit. And so the Spirit allows that to happen so that we can get a fresh word from heaven with tongues and interpretation. That tongue is for a sign to the unbeliever. And it's also kind of exciting even to the believer. It's a way to release your faith and step out and allow God to use us in tongues and then someone interprets and we're all blessed with a fresh word in our language, in our own English, if we're in America. Uh, English language, we get blessed from God in a fresh way. Make sense? The third use of tongues is not for public setting or it's not targeted toward the public. It's targeted toward God. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So I need you to see that there's three uses for tongues. Some have lumped it all together and said, nope, tongues was only for one reason. Just like when it happened in Acts chapter 2. And if you're not speaking in known languages, then it doesn't count. No, no. If you remember 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. So there's... Men tongues that we understand. I, I used to know a lady that's, I prayed, I prayed in a prayer group all the time. She spoke fluent French in tongues. She didn't know a lick of French in her own, in her own self. And so some people that knew a little French, and I knew a little French, we'd try to tell her what she's been saying. She's like, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. She said, I don't want to get it in my mind. It's coming from my heart. And she spoke fluent French. And I, it was so funny because uh, we would get into prayer sometimes. And um, 
she's praying in this French language, and all of a sudden she's saying, merci, 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 merci. And, and after the prayer meeting, I said, do you know what you're saying when you say that? She said, yeah, I think I'm calling out for mercy. I said, no. In French, merci is thank you. So she didn't even realize she was thanking and thanking and thanking God in a language some people could understand. Isn't that amazing? So some have lumped it all together and said, no, that's the only use, but it's not the only use. Sometimes your tongue will not be understood by anybody. And sometimes your tongues that you pray or speak will change. It may sound oriental, it may sound African, it may sound European. You never know what's going to happen because it comes from your spirit, not your brain. And this is where the intellectuals have a hard time with tongues because you have to bypass your, bypass your intellect. Isn't that right? Yep. Some people can't even get filled with the Spirit because they're trying to think their way through it. You can't, you can't think your way through it. You're going to have to shut your brain off and let it come from your Spirit. Let it come from the Holy Spirit who's next to your Spirit. That's how it happens. And that's the blessing of it. Okay? Now, turn with me real fast over here. Um, <clears throat> well, go to Jude 20. Turn with me to Jude 20. The first use or, or necessity of tongues is that tongues builds you up. Tongues makes you strong in spirit. Jude chapter 1. Can't get lost in Jude. Jude chapter 1, verse 20. Or let's read verse 19. <clears throat> and I'll show you something here. Jude, verse 19. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, and I'm not going to read the context, not having the Spirit. So the opposite of not having spirit, the Spirit is that you're sensual. You're of the senses. You're of the natural order. All you can live by is your five senses. All you can live by is your brain. All you can live by is your intellect unless you're filled with the Spirit. Once you have the Spirit, then you're opened up into God's realm. That's the blessing of it. Then he says, but you, so don't be like them not having the Spirit, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Isn't that exciting? Now these are terms that you, the first time you read them, it's like, I don't, I don't know what that means. Build up yourselves. Uh, the, the King James says, uh, edify. Build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You, beloved, build yourselves up. So sometimes you feel kind of beat down. What are you supposed to do? Build yourself up. Sometimes you feel kind of washed out. What are you supposed to do? Build yourself back up. How come some Christians don't have any strength? They hadn't prayed in tongues. Either they don't know anything about praying in tongues, or they do, and they haven't prayed in tongues. And that's why Brother Russ, and then he's going to get Aaron to help you, he's going to pay you all to pray in tongues. Because you'll be stronger, you'll be built up. You'll get big in the Spirit. You'll get bigger with God. You'll get more able if you pray in tongues. You'll be more able to handle life. You'll be more able to succeed, more able to conquer, more able to serve God. More in, And we're going to go through about 14, 15 different things that happen to you. Don't you want to get built up? Amen. Praying in tongues is vital for you. And when I talk about praying in tongues, I'm talking about praying in tongues for an amount of time. Uh, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Would change a per 15 to 30 minutes a day would change your life forever. Well, it would change your life as long as you do it. Uh, an hour would change your entire existence for that month that you did it. You would see God more clearly. Spiritual things would be, be more joyful. To, just everything would change if you actually prayed in tongues. There's a reason to pray in tongues. Now, here's the trouble with it. Uh, well, let me, let's, let's turn real fast over to... 1 Corinthians 14, so you can see this. 
Notice the term praying in the Holy Spirit. Now some have taken that and said it doesn't say praying in tongues. It says praying in the Holy Spirit. Did you th don't raise your hand, but did you think that when you read it? That it says praying in the Holy Spirit, not praying in tongues. How do you know they're the same? Uh, I need to show you that. You know, the inquiring mind needs to know the truth. We, we believers need to be able to explain these things and feel comfortable with them. If not, you'll carry too many questions, question marks around with you and it'll drag you down. If you're unsure about what the preacher said, if you're unsure about what you thought about God, you won't be as free to do it. If, if I could convince you that you must pray in tongues to be happy and healthy Christians, you would do it. But if you're 80% sure, you might not do it. I've got to convince you. The Word of God must convince us that it's an absolute must if you're going to succeed. I know, I, I, know, I know what I feel like when I've prayed in tongues versus when I didn't. I know when I've gone days or even weeks sometimes not really focusing praying in tongues. I know what happens to me. What do you think happens to me? I get sensual. I be, uh, my senses grow. Instead of my spirit man being taller, my senses are taller. And I'm governed by what I see. I'm governed by circumstances, emotions. If you're an emotional person, what do you think you need to do? Pray in tongues. If you're not an emotional person, still pray in tongues. The solution to not being an emotional Christian is to pray in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Do you think God's emotional? I'm talking, emotions are good. I'm not saying emotions are bad, but in a bad sense. When you're overboard emotional, you can't get anything accomplished. Everything moves you. Everything everybody says just blows you up. When you're in the Spirit, I can move straight ahead. So 1 Corinthians 14, are you there? I wanted you to see this, that praying in the Holy Spirit is the same as praying in tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 says this, For if I pray, notice this is not speaking in tongues in a congregation. And this is where the, some of the turmoil has happened, some of the conflict among the, trip, the church, is they were, talking about two, they were talking about two different things, but not realizing it. There's speaking in tongues for all, for all to hear, and then there's praying in tongues just for me and my Heavenly Father. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What does that mean? That means if I pray, my spirit's doing something, my mouth is doing something, my brain can't figure it out. And it's not supposed to. This is where many people have quit praying in tongues because it didn't do anything to their understanding. And the problem with the senses is that it wants to be touched. Did you know your five senses love to be excited? Don't your taste buds love to be touched? Aren't they mad when they're not? Isn't that why we chew gum? Isn't that why we have mints? Isn't that why we like to eat too much? Because your mouth loves it. Your eyes love to see stuff. The Bible says the eyes of a man are never satisfied. Not just men. The eyes of people are never satisfied, especially men. Humans love to be looking at something. None of you sit at your house and look at a blank wall. No, you look at a blank wall that has a big box on it with a digital stuff going nonstop. Isn't that right? Maybe not your house. Not you holy folks' house, but some people's house. Computer screen. Your eyes just are never satisfied. You know, you'd think that your digital stuff would help you do life better so you'd have more free time to seek the Lord or do something for other people. But no, you just want to keep looking at your digital stuff more. It just fills up all your time. Isn't that right? Okay, I'm get off on that. But <laughs> your, I'm, my point is your senses are never satisfied. They want to be excited. And that's why the Bible says the flesh lusts against the spirit. And the spirit lusts against the flesh. That means they got a problem with each other.
If you're doing something spiritual, your flesh is like, no, 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 no. When you want to go pray or read your Bible, no, no, we got things to do. No, no. Isn't that right? You're doing something spiritual and the phone rings and your senses say, oh, what is that? I wonder what that is. What could you, who could that be? I wonder if, that's important. That's important. Your brain just starts going crazy because your senses hate spiritual things. And your spirit hates natural things. Your spirit doesn't want you to get in natural ruts. It wants you to use your senses properly. It wants to be in charge of your senses, basically. Your spirit wants to be in charge of your emotions. The only way to let that happen is to pray in tongues. Make sense? If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. This is why so many people have a hard time praying in tongues, because their brain doesn't get to do anything. Their, all their brain does is sit there thinking, what a weird thing to, to hear. And that's where, it, it, what it'll do is, it'll, if you'll do it long enough, it'll shut your brain down a bit, so you can focus inward to the Lord. And you'll sense things better. We'll get to that. That's another benefit. Verse 15, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. See, notice he's talking about praying in tongues with no understanding. Synonymous with praying in the Spirit. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. So when you're praying with the Spirit or praying in the Holy Spirit, as Jude said, that means you're praying without understanding. But if you're praying with understanding, that means you're not praying with or in the Holy Spirit. Is that fair to say? Just terminology. I mean, and sometimes when you get, you get in there with the Lord and all of a sudden you're praying in English and it's very spiritual. I'm not saying that, but the terminology is either you're praying with tongues or you're praying with understanding, not both. Now once you pray in tongues and didn't understand it, you could ask the Lord, it says in here, pray that you may interpret. You can interpret your prayer after you've prayed it. You can stay sensitive to the Lord if He wants to explain or tell you what you just prayed out. It's not always necessary, though. Does that make sense? And let me say this about tongues. It's not praying in tongues and then translating your tongues. It's not translation. It's interpretation. Two different things. You familiar with those two terms? Kind of like Bible. When you, your Bible translation should be a translation of ancient text. Translating from old language to our language. Translating, not interpreting. Interpreting would be the writer saying, I think this is what was being said. Let me interpret it. That's dangerous. Okay? Now, we teach the Bible, and we, we can get things out of it, and we can uh, proclaim things that we see from it. That's okay, but as a text, I have to have exact translated text, word for word, from Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Don't give me your thoughts on what God said. And that's where some of the translations like the NIV, the modern translation, the New English translation, it's like they took it and said, well, I think in this passage God means this. Don't you dare tell me what God means. You give me exactly the words that were written by the Holy Spirit, and then I'll figure it out with my concordance. Make sense? Now, I'm not against all those translations, but don't use them as your main text. They're okay because they, they do bring light in some areas. Uh, it's kind of neat to see, but it's not... A, so that's translation versus interpretation. Same thing with tongues. When you get the word, and that's why in church when you hear a tongue, it might last for 30 seconds. Somebody speaking with tongues for 30 seconds, and then the, then the interpretation of that tongue is like one sentence. Or two words said over and over and over again. It's not a translation of the tongue. It's an interpretation of the tongue. I get all these words from heaven, and then this is how God interprets it. Does that make sense? To bless people, to edify the church. Notice this, verse 15. What's the conclusion? I will pray with the Spirit. Notice it's an act of His will. Paul's saying, I will pray with the Spirit. I'll pray in tongues, and I will pray with the understanding. I'll also sing with the Spirit. Or we could call it singing in the Spirit. And I will also sing with the understanding. So it's an act of will. You can decide right now to sing in English. You know any songs you want to sing? You could do it if you wanted to. Do you know uh, any prayer that you'd like to pray in English? You could decide right now to pray in English. Or you could decide right now to pray in tongues. 
Or you could decide right now to sing in tongues. You don't have to wait for the Spirit to move you and lead you and come upon you in a vibration. Some people had a magnificent experience the first day they were filled with the Spirit, spoke with tongues, they felt the fire, they had an earthquake happen, they, they whatever. And it was so magnificent, they've been waiting for that to happen before they pray in tongues again. You don't have to do that. It's an act of your will. You can decide, I'm going to pray in tongues. You don't have to wait for a feeling. You don't have to get in the atmosphere of the church. You don't have to have music going in the car. Some people think, well, you know, if I pray in tongues and the Spirit knocks me out while I'm driving, I can't do that. He won't do that. You won't get knocked out in, in your car. You can pray in the Spirit in your car and be edified and build yourself up. All right. So I just wanted you to see that. Now, the rest of the chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians 14 is important, but it's basically trying to bring the correction, get back in the middle of the road for the church to operate right together. So we don't get out of order in the service. That's, that's primarily why uh, 1 Corinthians 14 was written. But then it also has some good points in there, good spiritual truths that we can take out and apply elsewhere. Does that make sense? Go back to Jude with me. We'll come back here later. Go back to Jude with me. Jude verse 20. <clears throat> so, uh, praying in tongues will help turn you from a rough Christian into a smooth Christian. Did y'all hear me? Praying in tongues helps you go from being abrasive to smooth in the way you deal with people. If you're not praying in tongues very often, your attitude will be rougher. You'll almost, you could, the Christians could almost look like a worldly person if they're not praying in tongues. And that's why there's many, many non-spirit-filled people that have a very strong belief in Jesus Christ, but they, they don't have the love of God flowing like they should. It just seems like they're, they're harsh still. Like it didn't take, like their born-again experience didn't take quite enough. It's very true. Being spirit-filled gives us an advantage if we take advantage, if we pray in tongues. Here's what Jude said, verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. If you put it all together, which it is all together, this is how you keep yourself in the love of God. You ever get ir irritable? How many of you have ever been irritable in the past? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Or we could all raise our hand, maybe. If you've been irritable lately, I say you have not been praying in tongues much. And if you want to fight me on it, see me in the office. Because I would bet that you haven't been praying in the Spirit. If you have been praying in the Spirit a lot, I bet you're not irritable. Christians have no right to be irritable. Part of the love walk is do not be irritable. Don't be fretful. Don't let your emotions get off on others. Be considerate. So there's all these instructions in the New Testament, benchmarks that the Lord set for us that can only be lived in the love of God. Only, it can only be lived in supernatural, divine, agape love that filled our heart. Does that make sense? Now the Holy Spirit put the love in us. Praying in tongues helps the love stay on the outside. It helps it go from way down deep. Because if you talk to any born-again Christian, even if they're the harshest, meanest old thing you've ever met, if you talk to them long enough, you'll, you'll touch the love of God down deep in them. And, he, and, and way down deep, you'll sense, that yep, yeah, he's saved. He's just mean on the He's got a lot of crust on the outside. <laughs> His crust is real thick. Praying in tongues help you, helps you decrust yourself. So that you're tender, so that your spirit is right here. So if anybody gets close to you, I can touch you. See? The people that you, the Christians that you can't touch their heart very easily, they haven't been praying in tongues. Probably not spirit-filled. Amen? See, it's going over real big tonight. And no, I'm not talking about you, and I'm not talking about you, and I'm not talking about, not talking about anybody in particular, just in case you're wondering. But if you read this backwards, it says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. 
Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. So to stay in the love of God, the, 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 the supernatural, divine, powerful way, you're going to have to pray in the Spirit. Amen. It, you'll, you'll find new compassion for people. Now some of you have, feel that anyway, but praying in tongues will develop that into true divine compassion that, that can actually get the job done for people. Not sympathy and empathy, but compassion that moves you to bless others. Right. Hallelujah. Turn with me to Ephesians 4. So really we're on number two. Praying in tongues builds yourself up. Praying in tongues keeps you in the love of God. Keeps you in the love of God. One time somebody said, uh, it was some preachers got around, Brother Hagin said he heard them talking and they were saying, yeah, we just need a baptism of love going on around here. And you don't need a baptism of love. You need to walk in love and stir the love of God up that's in you. Brother Hagin told him, he said, well, then you all need to get saved because the love of God's been shed abroad by the Holy Ghost in you. <laughs> You're supposed to have the love of God going on. And if you don't, you need to stir yourself up, pray in tongues, let the love of God get out on the top of you. Right. <clears throat> Ephesians, we, we, we come up with all sorts of humanistic reasons. Just reasoning our own self. You know, the human opinion is, is one of the, the most detrimental things to the spiritual life of the Christian. For you to sit there and sit on your couch and reason yourself into some carnal thinking or some, something you just dreamed up to suit your fancy. Christians have suited their fancy for way too long. Sat on that couch and dreamed up what they believe. Dreamed up why they ought to do that. Dreamed up why so and so ought to do this. And dreamed up just their own opinion about how life ought to be. Taking one scripture out of context, twisted it up, and decided their, their life. Have the, and get stuck like in concrete in what they believe. You can't do that. You got to go to the Word of God. You got to open up. You got all these things in. You got to submit humbly to the Word of God. As soon as you see something that, that you hadn't done yet or that, that's not in yet or that you don't understand, oh, oh I got to do that. That's called the correction from heaven. You need to let the Bible correct you. Amen. That's why when you're sitting here and you hear things, you ought to, you ought to just take it like a man. Oh, I need to do that. There's times I'm sitting there when Joan and I go to other meetings and neither one of us is preaching. There's times I'm sitting there and then the preaching's going on. I think it happened Sunday when Brother Jim was here. And I looked over and I said, I know I need to do better in that area. I just, there, there's, my, my whole life is geared to, to please the Lord right. and to do things His way. I know that's, what, that's all that matters. In, in eternal things, that's all that matters. Did I do it well? Did I honor His Word? And so that means I have to bend to the Bible. Jesus said if you fall on the Word, you'll be broken. That's what I'm saying. He said if the Word falls on you, you'll be crushed. So make sure you take an active role in falling on it so that you don't neglect it for years and it fall on you. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 1. <clears throat> Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which, with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. I'm reading these to show you the, the call to love. The call to the tender and gentle love of God. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice this other thing, that to stay in the unity of the Spirit, you've got to stay close to the Spirit. To stay close to the Spirit, I say you need to pray in the Spirit. Sometimes we lose the... We lose the feeling of the Spirit. We lose the sense and atmosphere of the Holy Spirit because we hadn't prayed in the Spirit. <clears throat> let, me, let me take a side note just for a second. Praying in the Spirit can be described this way. The Holy Spirit of God gets words from God and tells your spirit, your spirit prays to God. God then tells the Holy Spirit who tells your spirit to pray other words to God. Your words go to God in the Spirit. God hears them, tells the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit 
informs your spirit. Your spirit prays out of your mouth words to God. So we've got God praying through you. That's why it's so powerful. God's praying the perfect will of God for you. He's praising the perfect way. He's worshiping the perfect way. Our worship has about 18 words in it. I love you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Even if you get Hebrew on it. Toda, Tehila. All those other ones. We only have a few words. I worship you. Thank you. And those are good. We need to do those as best we can. It helps in our, in our own language to hear ourselves say right things about our Heavenly Father. At the same time, I think there's probably a lot of words we don't have. There's a lot of attitudes we can't convey. So we let the Spirit do it through us. And we praise Him in this unknown language that's going up perfectly to God. Hallelujah. And then there's a spiritual blessing that takes place when we got the flow going. Yeah. So when God's flowing through you, that's when you get blessed. People keep thinking that the blessing of God is something that comes from the outside on top of you or comes into your garage in the form of a car. But the true blessing of God is the spiritual thing that takes place on the inside of you in the circle of life or the cycle of life with the kingdom of God. Amen? Verse 3, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all, through all, and in you all. I just wanted you to see that there's this unity of the spirit we're after. In, in, in each local church, there should be a unity of the spirit. Across churches, there should be the unity of the spirit. That's why it's very difficult for some of the non-spirit-filled churches to connect to the Spirit-filled churches. And that's, that's just the way it is. We can't do much about it. But for, for each individual's sake, you have to keep the unity of the Spirit. And so when I meet non-Spirit-filled people, when I meet denominational Christians, my love reaches out as far as they'll let me. I've always treated every single person that believes in Jesus just exactly the same. Okay? I'm no respecter of persons no matter what they believe as long as they're in Christ. Does that make sense? The whole body of Christ is all the same to me. One faith, one Lord, one spirit, one baptism. We're all together. And that's why for most new Christians, the first thing they recognize is all the divisions. And the first question is, why is there so many Christian divisions? Who's right? What should I do? It's because it's not right. It's not natural to be, for a body to be split. Amen. It's very unnatural. But just let me help you. There's not much we can do about it, so don't worry too much. You go all the way you can with the Word of God. Amen. You go all the way in your believing to the Bible. You stay as close as you can to all the gospel, all the scripture. That's why we call it full gospel. The full, whole thing is what you're after as an individual. Then you find others who are after the whole thing. You want people that are spirit-filled, that believe the whole Bible, that believe the whole New Testament, that major on the majors. And then that's how we meet together. Those of us who are after those things, we meet together. Amen? Amen. Amen. The unity of the Spirit is centered around Jesus Christ. The unity of the Spirit is not centered around a name, not centered around a building, not centered around the most fa famous place in the city, not centered around a denomination. It's centered around Jesus Christ. And that's what really separates us, okay? When we champion something here, it's championing the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We, we can't have all the other things. You know, it's kind of like the spiritual side of things is more than just uh, assigning us something to rally around. For instance, a uh, football team. The football team are faithful to the coach, faithful to that name. I mean, they got that logo. They're, they are a Mustang, if that's their name, whatever. Whatever they are, that football team is settled and they promote that. And to get that in them, they are whipped into shape on the field, aren't they? They are beat 
to a pulp if they have to be, to get that in them and, and help them cheer that name, basically. You know, you need cheerleaders on the outside to help the fans unite together in the unity of the spirit of that school. You find some churches, they're united around their church name, their logo, their thing, and they've lost some of the unity of the spirit amongst. Not all churches, I'm not pinpointing anybody. What I'm trying to do is get us focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why we're tight here. That is what... That is the unity of the Spirit we're looking for here. Amen? Okay. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Notice that if you keep these things, you're grieving the Spirit. I say to avoid these things and purge these from your life, pray in the Spirit. When you pray in the Spirit, it brings Him closer, doesn't it? Now, if He gets closer and there's anger in you, something's going to have to give. If you pray in the Spirit, your anger, your bitterness will disappear from you. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. Now, for carnal people, this is impossible. For carnal Christians, it's just as if you were a sinner, unsaved. You get bitter, angry, and you can't forgive. And that should not happen across the aisle of the church. I don't care what they did. Sometimes we read these things and they say, oh, well, that's just so marvelous as long as they don't hurt me. We rejoice about this until we get until someone offends us, until someone steps on our toe, until, until we get offended. Then it's like, what are you going to do then? If you haven't been praying the Spirit, I know what you're going to do. You're going to let it get to you. It's going it's to taint people. But if you've been praying in the Spirit, oh, it just, it just rolls off your back like water off a duck's back. If you've been praying in the Spirit, you're in the love of God, I can forgive you. I know you didn't mean it. I know you're just sometimes honoring. That's okay. See? It allows you to ignore sinners' sins. It allows you to ignore Christian sins. The love of God allows you to not get bitter and angry at people. Isn't that exciting? It's fun for me. I don't know about you, but I'm in it. I got in it a long time ago, and I had never been hurt in the church. Can, can anybody stand up and say that? I did. I, I, I got this in me a long time ago, and I've never been hurt in the church. That's a good way to live. I, I read in the Bible that if you love the Word of God, you won't ever be offended. Nothing will cause you to stumble if you love the Word of God. Isn't that exciting? It didn't matter what people thought about me. It didn't matter what people did. If they didn't accept me, if they didn't notice me, if they didn't acknowledge what I knew. I had someone tell me one time, you just don't understand. You only stand, understand one piece of the gospel. That's what they told me. And I said, no, I understand it all. And I didn't mean that I know everything. I just meant, no, no, I got, a bigger, I got a big picture. I didn't take it personally. It was person over me. I didn't take it personally. I thought, oh, they just don't know. It's okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, you don't have to get offended at people. You know, there's dodos that make error. I may have been one. <laughs> We're all human. We're all people, and we could make error. And if you haven't been praying in the Spirit, you'll take that error, and it'll get emotional in you, and you'll, you'll, you'll do something wrong. You'll sin against God and against people if you're not praying in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, <clears throat> verse 1, chapter 5. Just keep reading. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love. This is the agape love. This is divine love. This isn't natural humanistic love. This isn't, oh yeah, I just love everybody. No, this is divine love that has this spark of fire that goes out toward people. I care about you so much. If I've hurt you, I want to I fix it. I, if, if I've done something that you thought was wrong, I want to apologize. Please let me apologize. Amen? Amen. This is the love of God that never wants any animosity amongst the brethren. Never. That's why we're called peacemakers. We're supposed to be peacemakers always. Now, most people think, yes, I'm a peacemaker as long as... You didn't hurt me. 
Okay. <clears throat> we could preach on the love of God all night long, but I want to get to at least number three tonight. Turn to Philippians chapter 1. Praying in the Spirit helps you stay smooth. Glory to God. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 27. And, you know, let me just give you this. I, I was just thinking about that incident, why, why I even remember that. I remember because of the incident where someone told me something that wasn't quite right about me. I remember it because I've thought several times about it that, you know what, I handled it rightly, and we still have relationship. We still love each other. I hope they, they probably even forgot it, and I hope so. There was, no, there was no words, there was no evil thing that happened between us. I handled it properly. Never got any offense again. And we're still good friends in the gospel. Isn't that exciting? Amen. Yes, amen. I want to keep my relationships. I'm a covenant guy. I got covenant with you folks. Even if I don't know you, man, if I've seen you, I got covenant. I owe my life to you. Did you know that? I owe my life to Jesus. You're in Jesus. I owe my life. He says, oh, no, man, nothing but to love one another. Hallelujah. To me, this is something to live for. I don't know if you recognize, this is something to live for. This is something to live up to. This is a goal. This is a vision. This is a finish line between you and God. This is the ultimate dream is to walk in love your entire life on earth and spend the rest of your life in heaven with lots of jewels. That is a ultimate goal of life. And you'll have some other callings you've got to take care of and some business you've got to do and some success you've got to have. But ultimately, I think the first thing on Judgment Day that comes up is the love walk. We're going to think we're going to herd up all of our deeds and the very first thing that's going to come up and our deeds will be examined, but it's all going to come up in the love of God. Did you do your, your deeds in love? Did you, it's going to be the love walk. And the first thing in the love walk might be how you treated your spouse. <clears throat> what that does is it gives a vision for a husband and a wife individually to know that it's not about how I feel in this home. It's about how I love them. It's about how I walk towards them. It's about how I treat. It's about how I don't get bitter. You're going to answer for it in heaven. And if you do it right, you'll thank me when we get there for reminding you over and over and over. Because your marriage is not about how they treat you. It's not about how they think of you. It's not about, it's not, it has nothing to do with them towards you. Your marriage is all about you towards them. Are you obeying the Lord Jesus towards them? Well, I would if they would. And you'll answer for that in heaven. Which, answering for it in heaven means he won't, it'll be one of those things you'll feel funny because you displease the Lord. You're not going to get whipped for it. You're not, he's not going to make you wash your mouth out with soap. You're just not going to feel pleasant for a moment. You're going to recognize you didn't quite honor the Lord. That, that won't feel good. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Notice those terms. One mind, striving together, stand fast in one spirit. See, that's where we can't all just have all of our own things going. Everybody's got their own favorite stuff going, right? Like, your favorite football team is the Jaguar. Your favorite, who's your favorite football? My favorite football team is the Texans. I think you ought to all be Texan fans since you live in Houston. If you were all Texan fans, we'd have some unity here. But you all got all your own stuff going. Saying he loves the Saints. Joni loves the Steelers. Think about how our house is. <laughs> <laughs> I was 
In the sports arena, we're not in one accord. And it ain't as fun. That's carnal life and we can handle those differences, right? When it comes to the church, we can't have all of our stuff going. We can't have all of our banners raised. Well, I just think that. Well, I just think this. We're striving together for one faith. We're after one thing. This gospel means the same thing to us. Amen? This life is not all about me. When I get in here, it's not all about me. Now, between me and God, we got things going. You got things going with God. But when you come here, we're all together in this thing. We're trying to get down the same road. And the faster we get together, the faster we move. In the New Testament, when they got in one accord, miracles happened. Every time the early church got in one accord and got in one mind together, healings, miracles, salvations, multitudes. Amen? Being together is important. That's why we sing music. That's why we sing songs sometimes. I mean, that's one of the benefits to the worship time. It's to bring us together. Everybody comes in thinking about McDonald's and the kids and the mustard fell on the seat and all these other issues. And you get here and then we, we sing some songs before we continue. It brings us together, singing the same tune, headed in the same direction. Amen? It's not the only benefit to worship and praise, but it is one of them. <clears throat> okay, Philippians chapter 1. Yeah, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if, any, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. To succeed in the gospel, you're going to have to pray in tongues. Because it's all about this love glue. The love of God is the glue between us. It's the thing that keeps us together in the, in the Spirit. Praying in tongues helps us unite around the Spirit of God. Isn't that exciting? Let, let's think of it. Every, let's think of this section right here. Us, we ten people pray in tongues tonight in the Spirit for 30 minutes. And the mind of the Spirit, he's got one mind. And we're all praying in the Spirit. We're, he's uniting it. We don't even know what we're praying, but He's doing something spiritually to connect, whether it's us, uh, pray the perfect will for our lives, get us all in step so we're headed in the right direction. It could be for the church itself. could be individually. We're getting things lined up so that we're all in tune together. Isn't that exciting? And that's why some of you, before you come to church, you've been in the Word of God, you've been in prayer, and, and half the things we say from the pulpit, you've already seen that morning in prayer. That's one mind. That's the Spirit of God. Who's you, he's one person. And if we're praying in Him, we're going to have some of the same stuff happen. Amen. And you've got to like This is spiritual stuff. And you've got to like it. You've got to like it more than the natural blessing. <clears throat> Chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. See, that's where we have our own stuff going. Let nothing be done with selfish ambition. We've seen many people blow it in the ministry with selfish ambition. Blow it in life. With amb ambition usually ruins people. It's good to have drive and, and motivation and, and goals, but selfish ambition is a killer. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each esteem others better than himself. So in my mind, I have to look at Mark and, and think in my mind, he, he's better than me. Can you do those things? Yeah, Aaron's better than me. I, I, I look at everybody's qualities and I think, ooh, I like those. I, they're better than me. I keep that in me rather than I'm, I'm the top and I'm the best and I'm the this and the that. Amen? Amen. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So here is where he says, okay, think like Jesus. Have his mind. How are you going to get Jesus' mind? Only two ways. Through the Word of God, reading his Word, allowing the words from his mind to come in yours, and praying in the Spirit. 